There were really important things in the Reformers Pauline interpretation, perhaps especially Luther and Calvin, that have great potential to inform the way in which we interpret the texts today. Hi, I'm Rachel Bomberger with Erdman's Publishing. I'm here today with Stephen Chester, who is author of Reading Paul with the Reformers. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. I'd like to start, before we get into the book itself, mm -hmm. with the landscape for the book. Can you set the scene for us and, and share with us why you felt like this is an area that you needed to explore? Yes, certainly. Uh, I mean, I think it's really to do with the history of Pauline interpretation over the last few centuries. Uh, particularly in the Western world. Um, so uh, for a long time, uh, people perceived what was regarded as, as good or healthy or correct interpretation of Paul's letters to revolve around theological themes that were inherited from the Protestant reformers of the 16th century. Um, but then in the 1970s, uh, E.P. Sanders did his groundbreaking work on the nature of Second Temple Judaism. Um, which gave us a, a, a different um, and most of us would say more accurate picture of what was going on in Second Temple Judaism than we'd had previously, uh, particularly in relation to crucial questions about salvation. Um, and so that led to a reevaluation. Um, and from the late 1970s, early 1980s onwards, then often in New Perspective scholarship, uh, the reformers kind of reversed their role. In, instead of being the source of uh, what was good or healthy or correct in Pauline interpretation, uh, they came to be regarded as the source of, of unhelpful or inaccurate trajectories in the interpretation of Paul. Um, and so I was interested in that whole discussion, um, and, and that's the kind of landscape that, that lies in the background of the book. Far from being the heroes of the story now, mm -hmm. the reformers are you say they form sort of a dark backdrop mm -hmm. against which a lot of um, recent scholarship has mm -hmm. been done. Does this actually do justice to what the reformers were doing in their exegesis? Um, I think one of the things I want to do with this book uh, is complicate people's sense of that question. Uh, you know, because I actually don't think it's a matter of a simple either or. Um, I think the first thing that matters is that we get an accurate picture of what the reformers were actually saying in their Pauline interpretation. Um, and I think in recent Pauline scholarship that's been a problem. You know, there's a, a lot of good work out there on the reformers as biblical interpreters uh, done by our colleagues in church history, uh, but not many New Testament scholars have read very much of that material. Um, and so uh, the images of the reformers' interpretation of Paul that have dominated New Testament scholarship um, they've tended to rely very much on mid-20th century uh, scholarship in relation to the reformers. Uh, and with all the major figures, discussion has moved on significantly since then. Um, so that's one of the, the major kind of purposes of the book, uh, you know, to begin with, is, is to try and make accessible for, for New Testament scholarship, for Pauline scholarship, uh, a clearer and more accurate picture of what the reformers actually said in their Pauline interpretation. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us then about the book? W what do you do in it that is, that is new and uh, what's the shape of it? Well, I think uh, two or three things. Um, firstly, in, in trying to get that accurate picture of what the reformers said, um, I, I look at how they deal with some key themes in the interpretation of Paul. So uh, sin, the law, conscience, um, the works of the law, grace, faith, these are all really important themes in Paul where essentially with a few variations nearly all early Protestant interpreters say the same things over and against their Roman Catholic opponents. Um, and so uh, there is a kind of uh, framework for early Protestant interpretation that gets established quite rapidly uh, as a community of readers that, that structure how they think about the Pauline epistles and the way in which they should be interpreted. Um, and so I do some chapters where I try to lay that out uh, and explore those themes. But then also, uh, in a different part of the book, I look at some of the contributions that have been made by key individuals 
Um, so those who've been most influential in subsequent exegesis, um, which in my view means Luther, uh, Melanchthon, and Calvin. Um, so there's, there's, there's no surprises there in terms of which individuals are selected. Um, but there it seems to me there are some significant differences and variations in, in what they say. Um, not that they necessarily would have understood themselves in contradiction to each other, um, but there are other forms of difference than contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm interested in exploring um, how uh, they interpret Paul differently from each other in relation to the central themes of justification by faith uh, and being united with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second thing. And, and then the third thing, which actually is the very first part of the book, is, well, um, what's the purpose of all this historical work? Um, you know, as a New Testament scholar, uh, I'm not only interested in interpreting, you know, or understanding what went on in the 16th century, I'm interested in interpreting Paul's texts uh, for mission and for ministry today mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a Christian and a scholar. Um, and so uh, the question of how uh, the reformers' Pauline interpretation intersects with contemporary scholarship is a vital one for me. Mm -hmm. um, so the final part of the book is really all about, well, okay, having hopefully accurately understood uh, what was going on in the, the 16th century, um, how do we then evaluate it in terms of its relevance for today, and, and how do we bring it into dialogue with contemporary scholarship? So at the end of the book, you mm -hmm. put the Reformation understandings of Paul mm -hmm. up against the new perspective, and not the caricature, the actual, you know, based on, on the latest on research. research. Yeah. How, did, how did the two fare against one another? Well, it, it's interesting. Um, again, I didn't come out feeling it was neither or. I mean, I think uh, the new perspective represents a, a genuine and real advance in our understanding of Second Temple Judaism. So um, particularly in relation to caricatures of Judaism as a religion mm -hmm. of works righteousness, uh, I, I've no desire to turn the clock back <laughs> in that respect. And uh, I think that you know, it, it, the reformers were, were wrong in some of their exegesis there. Um, I think it's not surprising. They, they were not historical critical scholars. They were not trying to provide a historical critical portrait of Second Temple Judaism. But I think it's also vital to recognize um, that the way in which they used Paul's uh, language about the works of the law in their disputes with the Roman Catholic Church then established some trajectories of interpretation that, that later on were used to caricature Judaism in very unhelpful ways. Um, and so I, I, I think the first thing is it's important to say uh, the reformers were not right about everything. Uh, and, and there are some significant areas where the new perspective uh, really does represent uh, an important step forwards. Um, but having said that, uh, I also came to feel that there were really important things in the reformers' Pauline interpretation, perhaps especially Luther and Calvin, um, that have great potential to inform the way in which we interpret the texts today. Um, so um, partly, again, this is an issue about the works of the law in Judaism. Um, and there, I think, um, although, as I said, I don't think Judaism should be characterized as a religion of works righteousness, um, I think what's characteristic of Judaism in the ancient world in, in terms of its way of life is that uh, the law, the Torah, is, is all-encompassing. Um, what, what's characteristically uh, Jewish is, is this very idea of a, a way of life that is completely structured by God's commandments. Um, and so within that, um, there are very important elements that are about what the new perspective would call boundary markers. In other words, demarcating um, Jewish life um, from Gentile life uh, and, and doing it in ways that, that involve uh, ritual, as in the case of circumcision, mm -hmm. um, or involve diet, as in the case of food laws, uh, or worship practices, as in the case of Sabbath observance. Um, so those are all really important. But I think what the new perspective has missed here 
is that uh, the boundary between uh, Jew Jewishness or, or Judaism and the Gentiles is also in Paul's eyes and in Paul's world the, the boundary between righteous behavior and sinful behavior. Um, and so it, it's not, I think, that we have kind of ethnic identity or boundary markers operating over here yeah. and, and questions of other kinds of, of righteous or sinful behavior operating somewhere in a separate ethical sphere. Um, rather they go together and so actually when Paul talks in texts like the opening verses of Romans 4 um, where he's traditionally been taken to be talking about uh, righteous ethical conduct and, and, and saying that obedience to the works of the law in that way uh, does not uh, result in justification um, I actually don't feel we have any need to reinterpret that uh, so that somehow it's forced to speak about uh, the boundary markers between Judaism and the Gentiles that I just mentioned. Uh, I think we can take Paul uh, to mean what he appears to say without then also kind of projecting onto Judaism some kind of principle of works righteousness that, that, that represents a, a false or distorted view of salvation. Uh, so that's one very important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other important part of what the reformers still have to contribute is to do with their concept of justification by faith um, and how they relate that to union with Christ. Uh, I think that's really important for me in the book. Um, and interestingly, often in contemporary scholarship, that's where they've been felt to be most lacking. Yeah. Um, you know, often contemporary um, scholarship will will think about Reformation concepts of justification in in terms of being solely forensic constructs. Uh, a, a cold legal fiction would be the way in which their their views are sometimes caricatured. Um, and and actually, I think it's important to understand that in the work of Luther and Calvin, uh, justification takes place because faith unites us with Christ. And so they do absolutely think about uh, the righteousness we receive as Christ's righteousness. Um, they do think about that as coming to us from outside ourselves. Um, but they, they don't think about that as, as some kind of substance being transferred from Christ to us. It's not that for them, um, Christ is righteous and, and somehow through his work on the cross he's enabled to kind of take that righteousness or, or God the Father is able to take that righteousness and then transfer it over to us. Um, it's rather that through faith we're united with Christ and because we're united with Christ and, and he is the righteous one, uh, then we're able to receive his righteousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in that process uh, a new community is born which is the, the, the church made up of those who are justified. Um, and, and so uh, I think there's something important here uh, for contemporary interpretation of Paul um, where uh, we can maintain a, a strong sense of our dependence on the grace of God that comes to us from entirely outside of ourselves mm -hmm. uh, and yet also that doesn't mean that it's just a legal fiction that has real consequences and, um, and uh, changes people's lives in real ways uh, be because it's understood in the context of being united with Christ. And of course that doesn't only encompass Christ's righteousness as central as that is, that incorporates the, or includes the whole of who he is. Mm -hmm.